Certainly different when you and Chris did it. It was almost like two klutzes or two clumsy people, more of a, a comedic or, uh, kind of vibe between the two of you as opposed to what's happening now. Do you like the way that the, the franchise is going versus when, when you guys did it? And again, I, I'm a big uh, fan of the original. Those movies compared yeah, to the movies? Yeah, exactly. They're so totally different. I don't think there's um, really any way to compare them. I will say, in Donner's defense, he stayed much truer to the comic book. And the comic book is, is so true to its black and white morality. There's good, there's bad, and you help people in distress. And I think for little boys anyway, certainly my grandson, it's the first time little boys get in movie form that message. You be a good person, you punch up the bad guy and you get him put in jail, and you help children and ladies and whatever. Um, and so I think the simplicity of that message and the weakness of the Tom Hanks dialogue um, gave us something much easier to play than this new attack, which is let's explore Superman's dark side. And I don't think Superman really had a dark side as written. He wasn't a dark, screwed up character. He, that's why he was attractive. He was, he was really a pure guy. And I, and I think it might have been a production mistake, not a producer, not a director, but a conceptual mistake. That interaction between you and Chris, was that something that you guys kind of instantly clicked on? Was that mostly script, or was he? No, we, we bickered all the time. Uh, we, we, uh, he was sort of like my kid brother. When you're in your 20s, and you're 28, and someone's 24, and you're a female, they are a child. <laughs> a complete idiot and a child, and they don't know what to do with anything. And so that's sort of how I treated Chris. <laughs> <clears throat> Chris was so insecure that on the first movie he felt he had to tell everyone else what to do, which is kind of what guys do when they're insecure, which is they suddenly know everything and they're uh, the opposite of feeling insecure. And so on the first movie, we, as, and we liked each other as people, like they chess also we bickered really a lot. I go, don't you effing tell me I'm a great person. This is my 10th movie, and this is your first. And don't you forget, there's a lot of that. Um, but what you did see on camera was you saw a very, I believe like the Native Americans do First Nations, where the camera catches your soul. And, and you've got a huge 68 foot high close up of the person. You can tell what's going on. 
and what's truthful. And the intimacy that the camera caught between us was in fact a brother-sister arrangement. We, you know, had the same frames of reference, we were brought up in a similar fashion. Um, and uh, so what on screen came across as romantic love was in fact filial love. Makes sense, absolutely. Certainly, you're most known as Lois Lane, but of course, your your acting career credentials are are, are just uh, so so various and so long. You've been in the business for uh, such a long time. Is it is it an albatross around your neck? The fact that you know you're known as Lois Lane, uh, although you know you are an actor and you you know with Amityville and with Black Christmas and Sisters, you know you you are known to, to do other roles. I am, but you know, at this point, I'm 66. I have two grandchildren who are about to become adults, which is always a shock. There's a great poster that says, inside every old person is a young person going, what the hell happened? <laughs> and that's about how it works. And and so I, I, I am now so proud to be able to say, my grandchildren watch Superman and they love it. Gosh, I was part of a classic. Um, that it, is, it fills me with gratitude and, um, and a sense of having part of something that's figured myself it's important and, and I'm thrilled by it. Uh, there was a period in my career where I wanted to only play tortured young drug addicts or whatever. Somehow thinking that if I could act out all the turmoil inside me then I'd, I'd be free. I don't know what I want. But, um, uh, so there was a point where the we're going to open it up to the uh, crowd for some questions. And one final th Superman thing. Marlon Brando was never on 17 Folks, right? No, I knew Marlon from a movie called Missouri Breaks that my first husband had written. And, um, and I was directing the documentary and making of it. So I wasn't there when he arrived, but I heard lots of stories. And All right. Okay. We've got to have some questions for a legend here. Margo Kenner, hello. Hi. Just scream it out. Hi. I can't hear your turn. Okay.
this kind of movie and that kind of movie. I must say, I don't know half of who the characters are. But um, in the last three or four years, I've noticed more and more people coming up with pictures of Black Christmas and video covers. And I'm going, wow, oh, I own part of this. Hmm, I should be getting some checks in the mail. <laughs> That's dot number one. But also, um, it really does, strangely, I don't know why or how, seem to be having a little revival. We were kids when we made it. We made it on no money. Uh, Andrea Martin and I became friends on that. Um, she was a hoot. And, and we hung out afterwards like sorority girls. So I think all the fun in that is in the movie. Yeah, Martin, she appeared in a remake in the supporting role. Your we friend? Did? Yeah, she did. Huh. Yeah. She plays like the headmistress of the girls in uh, the remake. You might, you might like her role in it. I'm not sure you're going to like the remake, though. I think they had a remake, didn't they? They remade it almost 10 years ago. Yeah. Yes. How did you get the part of Los Angeles Superman? I got the part of Los Angeles Superman. I was living in Montana. I just had a baby. Oh no, I had her a year and a half before. <laughs> um, and I was desperate to work. And I had this wild and crazy romance with her dad. Um, and then he persuaded me to move to Montana. And I got pregnant. And suddenly he wanted me to turn into a little house wife like cook, clean, and, and you know, take care of the babies and that cook. And it was like, no, 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 I think there's an expiration date coming up here. And so that didn't work. So uh, when I was on my way to the screen test for Superman, truthfully what I was thinking is you have to get this part because you don't have the emotional guts to get out of the relationship unless somebody else boots you out of it. And if you get the part, he will boot you out of it. He doesn't think what well, should work. So I, that's why I got the part. I just went, look as if you love Superman. I didn't know who it was going to be. Look as if you love him. So I just went, right. In the back. Okay, uh, just a question about what's your, uh, what did you think about the Richard Donner type of Superman too? Well, you know, Richard Donner was so the perfect director for that movie. I had great admiration for Richard Lester. He couldn't have been a worse pick for directing Superman. His movies are very funny because they're satirical and wry and somewhat cynical. And what Donner did to the Superman comic was he took any cynicism out of it and made it really, really, really super real. Um, and even the comedy comes out of that. So I thought the Richard Donner cut, cut was far superior to the um, Richard Lester cut and done with much more love and care um, and only because of the producers who didn't want to pay anybody involved but they owed them did they uh, allow, uh, I call him Harry, the Dick Donner back into to recut his movie and a lot of that was because I would bring it up at Comic Cons and I'd say please write Warner Brothers, you've got to say, where's all the hidden footage? There's a bunch of hidden footage somewhere that nobody's ever seen. Superman 2, where is it? We want to see it. And out of that, because of all of you, came the Richard Donner cut of Superman 2. It's never happened before that 30 years later, a director gets to go back and finish his vision. So th that's for you. Thank you. Uh, uh, so, so. Silly? Well, yeah, because he was kind of more comic than he was in the comic books or in the So you thought he should have been more seriously evil? Yeah. Ah. Well, that would be Gene Hackman. I'll bet he could out argue with you on that. <laughs> I thought that casting was spectacular. I really brilliant. And, and I think what acting with Gene Hackman, I have to tell you, he's one of the best actors in the world. And he's so brilliant that every time he does a take, he brings a whole new take of the scene to the take. So 
I would just sit there with my jaw hanging over and watching, you know, jaw hanging open. And I would often forget that I was in the scene and supposed to sit up line because I'd be going, wow, he's good. Where'd that come from? And then suddenly everybody would look at me and be like, Pat. <clears throat> so that was his choice um, with daughters. I don't know how they negotiated that as a choice, but uh, I liked it. I, I, I thought it worked. Sir. Yes. Um, how did you like playing the mother? I don't know. We're kind of the key to the video. Oh, well, I loved it because the young girl was my niece, Janet Kim, who's a brilliant actress and a wonderful person. And so it was really fun to get to work with her. Did you think the character was good, or did you think it was good? Yeah, I thought she was fine. Gentleman in the back. Hi. Um, uh, because the Amityville has such a, a history to it, the Amityville house, I was wondering what uh, research you did into the house uh, before and during uh, shooting Amityville Horror. I lost you about halfway through. If, can you, if you oh. could slow down and then shout it. Stand up, that would help. Um, I was just wondering, because the Amityville house has such a, a history to it, what research you did uh, on the house uh, while shooting Amityville Horror. Well, I can be honest or dishonest. Well, let's say, I'll be honest. Honestly, I think most of that stuff is bunk. And honestly, I, I met the, the Lutzes, and they were not very curious people, and they were people of extreme faith. But I think probably what happened is something crashed, and they went, oh, the devil did it. So every time anything went wrong in their minds, you see what I'm saying? Their perception was it came from the devil. So I approached it with tongue in cheek in a way, as did the director, who used to make me laugh about 20 times a day. Um, uh, I was kind of amazed that it was the second highest grossing movie that year except for Superman, because part of me has never quite understood how people can consistently take minor things and put them into an entire devil program. I just, it, it didn't make sense to me. That's testament to you as an actor and, and your craft, basically separating what you think in your head, this is a lot of crap, versus if you've got a job to do it, you do the oh, job. Oh yeah, I had to, my character had to do it. Uh, there's no way I could play her like someone who's as cynical as I really am. <laughs> That wouldn't work. I think the character of Captain Lutz was very naive and very sweet and very innocent, um, and that they had a very conventional, old-fashioned marriage. And not only am I not necessarily all that sweet all the time, but I certainly wasn't any good at conventional marriage, and I tried several times. <laughs> sure, yeah. um, I have a question about Superman 4. I wanted to know. We all know how it turned out. I, I still enjoy, I enjoy watching movies because I've seen it since I was a kid. But I heard a lot of stories about production hell making that movie. I was wondering if you had any stories about making Superman 4. Making Superman 4? Yeah, how it was, because I know it's supposed to have a bigger budget. Well, what, here's what happens with movies. There's a lot of greedy people in the movie industry like anywhere else. And there's a lot of people, people who just want to be rich and famous for its own sake, not for doing good work. And so when people get a franchise that works, sometimes, and the Salkin brothers were two people like that, they just want to hold on to it and knock off the sequels fast, dirty, and cheap. So that's what they did. You know, they cut the budget way, way down. We couldn't possibly have done the effects you were supposed to. And it was produced by Canon Films back then. It was bought by Canon yeah. Films, but Canon Films didn't have much better no. reputation no. because uh, Menachem Golan then went on to, uh, to direct <laughs> and produce the worst production of the Brothers Karamazov. I think it was the Brothers Karamazov ever in history, which we did in World in, in Moscow. Um, but. A lot of people in the business are all about the money. So if you've got some Superman 4 and you think, well, it's guaranteed to make money, so it doesn't really matter what I do. Let's take out those extra lights. Let's do this, let's do that. So just one, one last question about Superman 4. I heard a story that Wes Craven was going to direct Superman 4 at one point because he directed Swamp Thing for DC Comics. 
What I heard was apparently Christopher Reeve was against was Creighton directing Superman 4 because apparently Christopher Reeve. Um, no. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, it, it just, Superman is so different. The TV, 
I thought of such great series, but that series is aimed at teen, and teens and it's about growing up in a weird way. So it can get away with it. I just don't think if you're going to make it an adult movie, you make it um, a movie for someone who's 18. You either, you either pick it, make it a kid's movie, which was just a common, or you make a movie for adults. They're not the same movie. Yeah, because Way in the back, it's all right. Right there. Okay. White shirt, sir. All right. Stand up, get up. Get all right. Up, get up, get up. I was wondering if you had any stories you could tell us about working on Rob Zombie's Halloween 2. Oh. I was going to ask that. Oh, <laughs> no, I, I didn't work long enough to have any stories, except that I didn't know who Rob Zombie was. <laughs> I live in this little town of 6,000 people in the Rocky Mountains at the, of Montana called Livingston. It's where they filmed something called the River Runs Through It. Kind of have it, but we only have one little theater in town, and there's one movie a week, and it's usually, you know, either a cartoon or Alexander or Schwarzenegger, or whatever. <laughs> so uh, I'm sort of isolated uh, a, a lot. Okay, what was the original question? I have to go uh, and, and just about working on Halloween too, like the experience. How did you get involved even with Halloween too? Oh, and so I got an offer. And then I went into the one kid I knew was hip in town, and I said, okay, who's this Rob Zombie guy? And he went, what? <laughs> you don't know who Rob Zombie is? Oh, God. So he pulls his computer out, and he types his stuff, and I'm looking at this sort of junky guy with blonde hair and tattoos, and, and then I hit play for the music, and it was horrible. I I go home and looked him up some more, and I thought, oh, I'm going to be working with a psycho. This is going to take. And I get there to do my part, and this guy is truly the sweetest man on the planet. He's a vegetarian pacifist who's never had a drug in his life. He's got pants here, I'm sorry to disappoint you. He never had nuggets, and I don't think he's ever had a drink. He's the sweetest. His, his persona is the opposite of whatever that thing he's developed is. And so I finally went, boy, are you conned your fans. <laughs> <laughs> but, so the experience was that I, I just adore him. I just I would have done anything for him. I really loved him. Thank you. Goodbye. Yeah. Uh, how about the movie on Captain Planet? I'm Captain Planet. That was a long time ago. That was fun, you know. Or mine. There you go. I, I, I love all the Superman movies. I especially love the scene in Superman 2, where at the end you got to uh, turn to Fedora and it was that fight scene and you said, You're a real pain in the neck. Can you give her a dab punch? I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that scene. Well, I actually hit her once for real, not meaning to, but she's never let me forget it. <laughs> <laughs> she's terrific fun, Sarah. <coughs> Right in the very back, in the cheap seats. Do you know what, sweetheart? Do you have a grown up with a really loud voice right next to you who could repeat the question? Yes, he would love to know what your favorite Superman movie to act in was. What my favorite Superman movie was? To perform in, yes. Um, I like Superman 2, the Dick Donner cut. I think that is Head and Shoulders the best movie out there of Superman. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Aside from Lois Lane, what was your most fulfilling role that you've done as an actor? Aside from Lois Lane, what? What, what was your, your favorite role that you've done? Oh, it's, it's so funny. I give everybody asks that question, so you mustn't feel odd. Everybody goes, what's your favorite role? I've done over 100 movies. And it would be like saying, who in your life, and I wasn't exactly Little Miss Cooking Two Shoes, uh, was your favorite boyfriend? You can't compare them. They're, some you have a terrible experience making, and the movie turns out to be great. Some you have a wonderful time making, and the movie turns out to be awful. Some of you like for some reasons, because it's the creepy, whatever. 
you can't really pick a favorite. It's as if, I've been married three times, and if someone said to me, who's your favorite husband, I couldn't answer it. But I had to at one point finally go, what's the common denominator that makes all these marriages go wrong? And then I finally had to go, it's me. That's the <laughs> so, in a way, with the, a movie, picking it out, what's, I have to look at it from a very different point of view. So I can't, I can't possibly pick. Speaking of boyfriends, <laughs> you dated Prime Minister Trudeau. How the heck did that happen, Margot? Well, actually, I was invited to go up to Ottawa right before he signed the Constitution for a dinner for young Canadians who had become successful. And I couldn't go because I had some commitment. I can't remember what. So I wrote him and I said, I'm awfully sorry, Mr. Prime Minister, I can't possibly come. I have this and that to do. However, I am working on the nuclear freeze campaign here in California, and I wondered if I could get you to endorse our platform. <laughs> and I got the sweetest letter, letter, letter back saying, Dear Ms. Kidder, I appreciate your letter, and I'm glad you were working on this. However, I am the head of state of another country, and I cannot endorse a platform on a state election. <laughs> I realized how naive I was yet again. Uh, so then I was doing Pygmalion in Toronto, and was reading about all they were going to test the cruise missile, the American cruise missile, over the Arctic, which is where I'm from, and I feel a great emotional attachment to. And so I called them up all in day <laughs> said, I want to talk to you about this. Um, and I'm such a jerk sometimes. Like, something's just, you think of in your past and you cringe from 30 years later. Um, and so he said, well, come and have lunch with me at Sussex Place and we'll discuss it. So I went up. Um, and he's the smartest man I've ever known on earth. We've been Five seconds, it was so clear I was in over my head. And then I kind of fell in love. And then you had Mounties uh, at your back call pretty much 24 7. Mounties taking you to the uh, donut shop or uh, for dinner and you had escorts, police escorts or things we like did, that. We did for a while. It's weird. Dating a prime minister is weird because <laughs> the guys, all the social security guys, you know. Things coming out of their ears, pretend they you can't tell. So they're working. Like if you walk around in Montreal late at night, this is one night, and you're when you're talking, they pretend they're window shopping. Like <laughs> I'm looking at, you know, old rent for one o'clock in the morning and checking out their ladies' underwear. And these great big guys. So it's there's it's pretty funny. What do we have? Yes, sir. Uh, I do have one quick question. You got to work with Richard Dunner again on Manfred, which I didn't recognize you at all in. I was wondering how much fun it was doing a little cameo for Richard Dunner and working with Bill Gibson. I yeah. just want to know. Rick, uh, Harry Dick put a lot of his friends in this cameo. Yeah, and that will be it. And, and so, unfortunately, with my cameo, he'd also cast an actor in New York. So this girl arrived, and I said, no, no, that's my part. She went, no, that's my part. And I thought, you Harry, I'll kill you. So I went to him and he said, well, tell her she has to come home. And I said, I'm not going to do that to another actor. So um, I went to her and we worked out how to do it as two sisters. Um, and I said, I'll tell her, I'll get the Book of Revelations because that's pretty gory and wild. And I'll just read this delicious stuff from the Book of Revelations and you can go back a lot to whatever direction. And that's, that's what happened. <laughs> okay, thank you. Anybody here? Yes, sir. Is this your first time back to Niagara Falls since you got to see in the falls? Was it your first time back here in the falls um, after you shot the Superman 2 scene you at Table Rock? I can't remember. I was trying to think of that today. I think I've been back, but I can't place where or what. It was down further in the gorge when you jumped in. Um, and <laughs> hoping that Superman would save you. You want me to jump in again? <laughs> Not gonna Any final questions for Marco? Yes, sir. Do you have a photographic memory when it comes to dialogue? Do I have a what? Photographic memory. Uh, oh, dialogue. God. Here's something about getting old you should all be warned about. <laughs> that 
photographic memory you have when you're young? Mm -hmm. uh, so I used to be able, as did my niece and all of us were young, read a scene, you'd already broken the scene down so you knew what you were doing it and why, who, where, what, why, how, you figure out. But the dialogue would just come naturally. And now, the amount of work I have to put into memorizing a scene is just, it's beyond belief. And um, it, it's kind of scary to realize that you can't just read your scenes and got that. It doesn't work anymore. So it's a bit scary. Yes, sir. What was it like working with Brian De Palma on Sisters? It was heaven working with Brian De Palma on Sisters, partly because he was my boyfriend <laughs> uh, and we were living together. And, but mostly because Brian loves actors and he knows what actors do and he knows what they need to make a scene work. And so his whole focus on the set and people on crews generally take their cue from directors is that this is about what the actors are doing. That's what shows up on the screen. So when they're working, you be quiet, you be respectful, you really you want to have a chat about your new baby, go up in the hall. But that's what we're doing. So he was wonderful to work with. You did. It's a real high end, folks. And from the Prime Minister and, uh, and Richard Pryor as well. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it just... Actually, at one point, both of them at the same time. Wait, what? <laughs> All right, Marco, I love you now. Unbelievable. Yes, ma'am. Are you working on anything now, or do you have anything upcoming? Am I what? Are you working on anything now? No, or actually, I sort of am. I, I wanted to do a documentary. I wanted to, I feel very committed to the notion that at 66, I've been given so much in life that I have an obligation to try and ameliorate the hideous effects of climate change that are going to hit my grandchildren really bad and starting very soon. And so I work with different environmental groups. And what I wanted to do, I have a dear friend named Tantu Cardinal, who's a Cree actress here in Canada. She's just brilliant and wonderful and to die for. Is have us go from Montana, I just call it going home gone, and, and, and go from Montana up through northern Montana, which has now been made a wasteland of for fracking for oil and fracking for gas, and up through the tar sands, and then and the effects of that on people, again, not on the environment, but it, basically the effects of the, uh, the oncoming climate change on the human heart, and the oil companies who can't seem to grasp it. And then go on to the Yellowknife and up to the Arctic Circle, which of course, and the Arctic Ocean, which will be melted. And to see it through human hearts. And then I was talking to Tantu and I went, this could be a really funny movie, two old ladies setting off, um, and we have great chemistry together. Two old ladies like Thelma and Louise, but a lot older, <laughs> driving the ice road, like ice road truckers, you know, getting up to the north to blow up the shell drilling rig or something like that. So we're throwing something around to have something that will have a certain political element in the sense that, guys, this is really happening, and we all, we're obligated to our grandchildren to do our part, each of us, however small it is, to stop it. You guys are obligated to get rid of Harvard. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, Michael Gordon directed the, the Obinus role. It would be bigger than Lois Lane, absolutely. Is, is there a website? Is there a way some people can no, run out that point yet? Okay, good. A few more. Right at the back. Are you planning on doing any live theater? Any live theater down the I, I have done a little live theater. I like it. It's time consuming. You know, I have a, my life is not about show business anymore at all. It's about my grandkids and my friends and, and my political activism and, and my dogs. I have great dogs. I have three dogs and my puppy turns one. In fact, what's today? Today is the June 6th. He, he turns one today. All right. He's a great pyramid. He's 140 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> He's really cute. So that's.
that's what I do. Um, leaving my home and going on the road entails a lot of logistical planning. And it would have to be a really extraordinary play. I don't, I'm sorry. I don't know if this question was already asked, but I'm not sure if I'm right, but did you go to Haverhill? I didn't go to Haverhill. Yeah, How do you know that? that? Well, because I worked at an independent school in, um, in, in uh, Toronto, and, and I was just wondering if your um, love of acting started in high school, I mean, while you were there, or... Yeah, I, that was my first play was at Haverhill. Oh, wonderful. I was Toodles in Peter Pan. <laughs> yeah, I loved it. It was fun. And, and also, secondly, if your experience in an independent school that was all girls influenced, you know, your other decisions. Well, I only went to Haverhill for two years because I was on a scholarship. Our family didn't have any money, and by the fourth report card saying we wish she'd put her energy in a more positive direction, it was pretty clear I was going to lose the scholarship. So I ended up at a school in Vancouver, a co-ed high school. I think there should be all-girls schools and all-boys schools, especially during high school, because the distraction of your hormones at that age is so huge that you're not capable of learning anything. You act like a fool if you've decided to fall in love with the guy in your science class, six rows behind or something. And, and, I, and I think the notion of you know having girls and girls schools and boys and boys girls is a really good one. Time for a couple more quickies. Yes, sir. Um, with all the things you did in the suburban, this is all I mean in the first place. What was the hardest thing for you physically? Hardest stunt. Hardest stunt physically. Of all the movies? Yeah, of all the movies. Do you know, I, I have to really think about it. I, I, it doesn't come to me. Don't, I don't know. I honestly don't know. Should get fish out of the gorge, is probably up there. Yes, sir. Uh, I was wondering yeah, about Andy Milhauer. How was it like to work with James Brolin? Who? James Brolin, your co-star from Andy Milhauer. How did he like to work oh, with Oh, it was okay. <coughs> we, we didn't, we weren't very close. We were very different type of people. Um, it was a very respectful relationship. Yeah. One more. That, that's it. We got to go. You said, yes, you said you were married. What? You say you were married to Yeah, briefly. Were they all actors? No, I was married to a French count. I was a count of <laughs> You have to give that back? That must be happy. They said they turned out fine young ladies, and I got them. You know, like, um, uh, <laughs> what was I saying? Was it the <laughs> I got distracted by my nervous and rude thoughts. What? Oh, oh, okay. And then the French crop count was also a director. He directed something called King, King of Hearts, a beautiful movie. I married an actor for a month and two days, um, and then filed for an annulment, and they said, no, it has to be just a month. And I said, come on, just give me two days. No. And then um, my daughter's dad, it was, that was in the early 70s, and we legally married, illegally, whatever, married ourselves like you did as hippies in the backyard of the whole thingy. And then by the time we legally got married, which was two and a half, almost three years later, the relationship was pretty much over. It was, it was legally over about nine months after that. So they were very quick. I, I was not meant to be somebody's wife. <laughs> You were meant to be Lois Lane. That's what you were meant to be. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let's hear it from our Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.